Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing cholesterol biosynthesis. Okay, so, um, basically, in the previous video I told you that cholesterol uh, biosynthesis occurs completely in the cytoplasm of the cell. However, the starting point for the biosynthesis of cholesterol is acetyl coenzyme A, which is in the matrix of the mitochondrion. So what we now need to do is get acetyl coenzyme A out of the matrix of the mitochondrion and into the cytoplasm of the cell so that we can actually start producing uh, cholesterol from uh, scratch, basically. Okay, right. So, what I want to discuss with you then is the pathway by which we get cholesterol out of the matrix of the mitochondrion. So, let's start with just a little bit of revision about the structure of the mitochondrion. So, basically, mitochondria are unusual for intracellular organelles in that they have two membranes, an inner membrane and an outer membrane. Okay, and the inner membrane has these invaginations inwards uh, called Christi. Okay like so. So this is a mitochondrion. Okay, so the plural is mitochondria. Okay, so uh, basically the outer membrane which faces the cytoplasm here is quite permeable. Okay, so it's quite easy to get across the outer membrane. Whereas the inner membrane is very, very tight. And the reason it's very, very tight is that it's the uh, site of oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, so in the electron transport chain, what happens is that uh, electrons are passed from complex to complex to complex. Okay, and in that process, what happens is you pump protons from the matrix into the um, space between the two membranes, which is called the intermembrane space. Okay, and uh, the way that the, well, the, the complexes get the energy to do this maneuver from the electrons, which are gradually releasing energy as they are passed along the electron transport chain. Okay, and uh, what that gradually builds up is a very strong proton gradient across the uh, inner membrane of the mitochondrion. Okay, and not only is it a concentration gradient, but you've also got a strong electrical potential difference gradient. In, in fact, the electrical potential difference across the inner mitochondrial membrane is around 160 millivolts, meaning that the electrical potential in, within the matrix of the mitochondrion, which is the name for uh, this space within the inner membrane, uh, is a 160 millivolts lower than the electrical potential of the intermembrane space. Okay, so this space between the two membranes is called the intermembrane space. Okay, right. Uh, and then uh, what happens is those protons have to remain in the intermembrane space. They can't be allowed just to move back into the matrix, because if they just moved back into the matrix, then it would be completely pointless. The energy would be dissipated as heat, uh, and you wouldn't be able to use it to build up uh, ATP, basically. Okay, so... That's why the inner membrane of the mitochondria has to be so tight so that the protons can't just move across it back from the intermembrane space into the matrix. And instead, the only way the protons can get back from the intermembrane space into the matrix is via going through ATP synthase, which will harness the energy from the protons moving down their chemical and electrical gradients, and um, use that energy to bind ADP to inorganic phosphate to create ATP. Okay, right. Uh, so, um, that's a little bit of a reminder of the structure of a mitochondrion. So, we would expect that the outer membrane would be quite easy to get to through, but the inner membrane would be very difficult to get through, and indeed that is correct. So we need a way of getting acetyl coenzyme A, which is within the matrix of the mitochondria in this inner space here, across the inner membrane of the mitochondria into the intermembrane space, then it can diffuse out into the cytoplasm uh, f through the outer membrane on its own, basically. So let me show you the mechanism that we have for doing this. Okay, so... Basically, we know that in the matrix of the mitochondrion, okay, so I'll show this as the um, outer membrane, and this is the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. So this is the matrix, let's say, here, okay, 
and uh, this is the cytoplasm on this side. So, in the matrix of the mitochondrion, we have acetyl coenzyme A. So, let me show the structure of acetyl coenzyme A. So, basically, acetyl coenzyme A consists of an acetic acid molecule linked via a uh, phosphoester link. Sorry, not a phosphoester link, a thioester link uh, to the thiol group of a coenzyme A molecule. Okay, so basically we don't need to know much about coenzyme A. All we need to know is that basically it has this important functional group, which is a thiol group. Now, thiol groups are actually very similar in structure to alcohol groups. Um, sulfur is in the same group of the periodic table as oxygen, so it has very similar properties chemically to oxygen. Okay, so what you have here is a sulfur atom linked to a hydrogen atom. If that sulfur atom was replaced by an oxygen atom, that group would be an alcohol group. Okay, but we've said that sulfur has similar chemical properties to oxygen, so we might expect that this thiol group is going to have very similar properties to an alcohol group, and indeed it does. Okay, so basically you can link thiol groups onto carboxylic acid groups in much the same way as you can link alcohol groups onto carboxylic acid groups. And you can take the alcohol group off the carboxylic acid group, you can take the hydrogen off the thiol group, combine those together to make water, and then bind the sulfur atom onto the carbon of the carboxylic acid group to make a, what's known as a thioester link here. Okay, so this link where, which is similar to an ester link, except that we've used a thiol group rather than an alcohol group, is called a thioester link. Okay, and this molecule that we've got here now is acetyl coenzyme A. Okay, right. And acetyl is the name for acetic acid with the alcohol group removed. So all that I've shown you here, this methyl group with the uh, carbonyl group of the carboxylic acid group, that is known as acetyl, basically. Okay, and then when you've attached it to coenzyme A, the whole thing is then called acetyl coenzyme A. Okay, right. So how are we going to get the acetyl coenzyme A out of the matrix of the mitochondrion and into the cytoplasm? Well, basically what we're going to do is we're going to firstly bind the acetyl coenzyme A to oxaloacetate to create citrate, which is the first molecule of the citric acid cycle. Then we're going to shut all the citrate across the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. And then in the cytoplasm, we're going to um, reconvert it back to acetyl coenzyme A. So let's discuss this reaction then. So firstly, we need to see the structure of oxaloacetate. Okay, so oxaloacetate is a four carbon molecule. Okay, and again, when we discuss oxaloacetate, we mean the um, conjugate base of the molecule. So we're going to see that the carboxylic acid groups in this structure have lost their protons, basically. Okay, right. So here is the four carbon structure here. You've then got a carbonyl group coming off the second carbon here. Then off the first and the fourth carbons, you have carboxylic acid groups. Okay, so both the first and the fourth carbons are involved in carboxylic acid groups. And both of these carboxylic acid groups have lost their protons, basically. They've donated them away into solutions. So we are looking at the conjugate base here. Okay, and then we have two hydrogen atoms coming off this third carbon here. So this is an oxaloacetate molecule. Okay, right. Uh, so... What you can then do is there is an enzyme within the matrix of the mitochondrion which can combine oxaloacetate with acetyl coenzyme A. And then the final thing it also needs is a water molecule. Okay, so I'll put this here. So we're going to combine oxaloacetate here with acetyl coenzyme A and a water molecule. Okay, and we're going to create citrate. So firstly, let's discuss what will happen with um, the water molecule, what this water molecule is going to do. Basically, that's going to be involved in breaking this bioester link between the carbon atom of the um, carboxylic acid group of the acetic acid molecule and also the sulfur atom of the coenzyme A. So this is going to be involved in the hydrolysis of that bioester link there. 
Okay, so what you're going to do, or what you can imagine doing, is breaking that bond between the carbon and the sulfur atom. Now, in covalent bonds, you have two electrons, one from the carbon and one from the sulfur. And what you can imagine doing is sending one electron back to the carbon and one back to the sulfur. Okay, then what you can imagine doing is breaking one of the bonds within the water molecule here. Okay, so send one electron back to the hydrogen and one back to the oxygen. And then this oxygen has a free electron, this carbon has a free electron. You combine that alcohol group to that carbon atom to form a single covalent bond. And then this hydrogen has a free electron and this sulfur atom also has a free electron. You combine that hydrogen atom to the sulfur atom to recreate a coenzyme A molecule. Okay, so you'll recreate coenzyme A like so. Okay, right. And what you can then imagine is we have acetic acid formed. Okay, of course, we're not actually going to get acetic acid formed at any point in this reaction, but just to make sense of what's happening. That's what the water is going to be involved in doing. Now what we're going to do is attach this acetic acid that we have imagined forming to the oxaloacetate molecule. So what you're going to do is break one of the bonds between this carbon atom and this oxygen atom here in this ketone group here. So break one of those bonds and again imagine sending one electron back to the carbon and one back to the oxygen. Okay, right. Then imagine breaking one of the covalent bonds between a carbon and a hydrogen atom in this methyl group of the acetic acid molecule. Okay, and imagine sending one electron back to the carbon and one back to the hydrogen. Then, attach this carbon, which now has a free electron, to this carbon, which has a free electron, and attach the hydrogen, which has a free electron, onto this oxygen, which has a free electron. And what you'll create, then, is this. So let's try and draw it as much as possible in the same way as we've drawn this. So all of this bit here is remaining exactly the same. So this bit is unchanged from before. Okay, we've then got this carbon in the middle. It's now got an alcohol group coming off it. Okay, so that's the new thing because we added a hydrogen, remember, onto this oxygen. So the oxygen's no longer got a double bond between itself and this carbon. Instead, it's only got a single bond and then it's got a hydrogen off it instead. So that's that alcohol group. We've then got this carboxylic acid group, which is in the uh, conjugate base form. Okay, like so. And then this carbon is going to have a new bond which is to this carbon here. So let's now put this in here. It's got this CH2 here, which is that methylene group that was here. And now we've got this carboxylic acid group. Now, originally, I told you that we put an alcohol group on there. Under physiological pH, what will happen is this alcohol group will lose its proton. So it will become deprotonated, like the rest of these carboxylic acid groups. And you'll have uh, an oxygen with a negative charge left there. Okay, so this molecule now is citrate, which is the conjugate base of citric acid. Okay, so under physiological conditions, it will be in this unprotonated form. Okay, and the enzyme which catalyzes this conversion of oxaloacetate into citrate is citrate synthase. Okay, and it requires an acetyl coenzyme A and a water molecule. Okay, so all of these are coming in. Right, okay, what's now going to happen is this citrate molecule is going to be transported across the inner membrane of the mitochondrion into the intermembrane space. So this is the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. This is the outer membrane of the mitochondrion. So basically, there is a protein here which is involved in the transportation of citric, uh, sorry, citrate molecules across the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. So let me colour this in in blue here. So this is known as SLC25A1. So this is SLC25A1. Okay, and this is going to take this citrate, whoops, this citrate molecule, and it's going to move it into the intermembrane space. Okay, and then the citrate will just diffuse across the outer membrane into the cytoplasm. So, we've now got our citrate molecule within the cytoplasm. What's now going to happen to this citrate, as, uh, citrate molecule uh, to convert it back to um, acetyl coenzyme A? So, we want to get the acetyl coenzyme A out of this now. 
So, we've now got our citrate in the cytoplasm, so what's going to happen to it now? Basically, it's going to go undergo the reverse process to what it just went through. Okay, so it's going to meet an enzyme now that's called ATP citrate lyase. Okay, which is going to be involved in lysing citrate and also ATP. Okay, right. So, what it's going to do basically is it's going to bring in a molecule of coenzyme A. It's also going to bring in a molecule of ATP and the ATP is going to be hydrolyzed, the citrate is going to be broken apart back into oxaloacetate and the coenzyme A will bind to the acetyl group that we give off. Okay, so let me try and show you what's going to happen here. So we're going to undo this reaction basically now. So what we're going to do is reform a double bond between this carbon and this oxygen here. So this oxygen is going to give up this hydrogen atom. So you can imagine breaking the bond between that oxygen atom and that hydrogen atom. Send one electron back to the oxygen, one back to the hydrogen. You can imagine breaking the bond between that carbon and that carbon. And I should just stress that this is by no means an electronic mechanism. This is just to understand how the things on one side add up to the things on the other side. Okay, so you can imagine breaking this covalent bond between these two carbons. Send one electron back to this carbon, one back to that carbon. Break this bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen, send one electron to this oxygen and one to the hydrogen. Then form another covalent bond between the carbon and the oxygen. And what that will recreate us back again is the oxaloacetate. So let me show oxaloacetate now. So remember this is this four carbon molecule where we have these uh, conjugate base carboxylic acid groups at either end. Okay, like so. So here is another carboxylic acid group on this end. Okay, right, and we're going to put that hydrogen back onto this carbon here to recreate the acetate molecule as it would be because we're talking about the conjugate um, base of acetic acid and that's called acetate. Now the acetate isn't going to last for long, we're going to convert it back into acetyl coenzyme A. So. Basically, what we're going to do is bring in another molecule of coenzyme A, and again, we don't need to know what the structure of coenzyme A is, we just need to know that it has this one important functional group, which is this file group here. And what we're going to do is we're going to form a thioester link between this carboxylic acid here and the file group of the coenzyme A. And what that will produce is it will produce water because this time it's a condensation reaction. You'll get this oxygen from the uh, carboxylic acid group. You'll get the hydrogen from the uh, thiol group. Those will make a hydroxide anion originally and then they'll bind a proton from the solution to make water. Okay, right. So this will produce you acetyl coenzyme A. And basically, you're going to use that water that you produce to hydrolyze a molecule of ATP. So ATP is going to be hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. Okay, so the water molecule that you produce from the condensation reaction between the acetic acid molecule and the coenzyme A molecule is going to be used to hydrolyze ATP to ADP and inorganic phosphate. Okay, right, and that that's um, why this enzyme is called ATP citrate lyase, because it lyases both ATP and also the citrate. Right, so you recreate, therefore, this molecule of oxaloacetate here. Okay, right. What's now going to happen is this molecule of oxaloacetate is then going to be further converted into pyruvate and the pyruvate will be transported back into the um, matrix of the mitochondrion. So I just want to complete the processing so that we see where this oxaloacetate goes because we don't want it just to be left within the cytoplasm. It's going to go back into uh, the matrix of the mitochondrion. But we have now got our acetyl coenzyme A molecule in the cytoplasm successfully. So that's how we're going to shuttle the acetyl coenzyme A from the matrix of the mitochondrion into the cytoplasm so that we've got the building blocks for our uh, cholesterol molecules. Okay, right. So uh, let's now see what conversions we're going to make to the oxaloacetate molecule. Basically, we're going to start off 
by reducing it from oxaloacetate to malate. Okay, so let me show you this conversion. So basically, we're going to reduce this ketone group here. So what you can imagine doing is breaking the um, one of the bonds between the carbon and the oxygen. Okay, so not both of the bonds, just one of those covalent bonds, and sending one electron back to the oxygen and one back to the carbon. Okay, then uh, you can bring in uh, the, a molecule of uh, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, which is reduced. Okay, so we're going to bring in one of these electron carriers now, which is a reduced form, and then it's going to go back to the oxidized form, NAD plus here. So it's going to provide a hydride anion, but we need more than that. We also need a proton from the solution. Okay, and when we do that, we're effectively adding in two hydrogen atoms because if we've got the proton and we've got the hydride anion, then the hydride anion can give one of those electrons to the proton and we then just got two hydrogen atoms. So what we're going to do is bind one of the hydrogen atoms onto this oxygen here to create an alcohol group and we're going to bind the other hydrogen atom onto this carbon here. Okay, and what that will give us is malate. So let me show this. So we're reducing the oxaloacetate to malate. So we'll have an alcohol group here coming off that second carbon with a hydrogen also coming off it. Then here we've got a methylene group like so. And then on the other side we've then got a carboxylic acid group down here which is again in its conjugate base form. And this molecule is then called malate. Okay, and basically this conversion of oxaloacetate into malate is called malate, well, it's catalyzed rather, by malate dehydrogenase. Okay, so the enzyme that catalyzes this is named for catalyzing the reverse reaction. So basically it's named because this reaction will be reversible and it can convert malate back into oxaloacetate. And when it does that, it will be removing hydrogen atoms from malate and therefore it's malate dehydrogenase. Okay, right. Uh, so... We've now got malate within the cytoplasm. We want to take it further. We want to take it uh, to pyruvate, basically. So what we're now going to do is we're going to uh, bring in a molecule of uh, NADP this time. Okay, so in will come a molecule of oxidized nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate, like so. And it's going to go out being reduced, okay? So, like so. So how are we going to provide this with a hydride anion? Well, basically, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, firstly break off this carboxylic acid group on the end here. Okay, so what you can imagine doing is breaking this bond here, okay? and sending this time both electrons to this carbon atom here. Now you might be asking, why am I saying send both of them there? Well, because this time this oxygen here has a negative charge, which means that it has two, uh, well, it has a lone pair of electrons that it doesn't need. It can then use that lone pair of electrons to make a, another bond between itself and this carbon. Okay, so it will put both electrons in and effectively donate one to that carbon. Okay, so when we nick an electron off this carbon by giving both of these electrons to this carbon, this oxygen will be able to put two electrons into a covalent bond between itself and this carbon, and then it will effectively give the carbon an electron and create another bond here. So, one of the byproducts of this reaction, hence, is going to be carbon dioxide. Then, you've put the two electrons onto this carbon here, okay? Now, what you're going to do is you're going to undo the work that you just did through uh, reduced NAD. You're going to break these two protons off again, okay? Or rather, these two hydrogen atoms. So, break both of those bonds. Break the bond between this oxygen and this hydrogen. Imagine sending one electron back to each member of that bond break the bond between this carbon and this hydrogen, imagine sending one electron back to each member. Then form another bond between this carbon and this oxygen to create a double bond there. And now you've got two hydrogen atoms. Take one of the electrons off one of these hydrogen atoms and give it to the other one to create a hydride anion. Bind that hydride anion onto the reduced NAD, sorry, onto the oxidized NADP, 
okay, to create reduced NADP, and then bind the proton that you've got left over because you took one of the electrons off a hydrogen atom and gave it to the other hydrogen atom, bind that onto this carbon which has two electrons here. And what you'll end up with then, right at the end of all of this, is a molecule of pyruvate. Okay, so here's the carboxylic acid group. Here's the second carbon with an oxygen double bound to it. And then on the end, you've got a methyl group, like so. Okay, so this is pyruvate, okay, which we've already seen. This was our example uh, when we were talking about acids and conjugate bases. So basically what we have done is we have uh, brought this citrate molecule out of the matrix of the mitochondrion, retaken a molecule of acetyl coenzyme A from that citrate molecule, and now we've converted what we got left over into a pyruvate molecule, and then the pyruvate molecule is then going to be retransported back into the matrix of the mitochondria. Okay, so basically out came the citrate molecule. The citrate molecule is going to be converted to a pyruvate molecule here, okay, whoops, pyruvate, that should be a U there, not a V, pyruvate, and now the pyruvate is going to go back into at the matrix of the mitochondrion for another enzyme here, and this other transporter, which transports the pyruvate into the matrix of the mitochondrion, is known as SLC, again, and then this time 16 a1. Okay, so SLC16A1 is going to transport pyruvate back into the matrix of the mitochondrion, and then it's going to be converted back into oxaloacetate. But before I just tell you about that conversion, uh, let me just give you the name of the enzyme which performs the conversion of malate into pyruvate. It's called malic enzyme. Okay, so this conversion was uh, undertaken by malic enzyme. Okay, right, the final conversion then is going to convert pyruvate back into oxaloacetate, but the pyruvate is now within the matrix of the mitochondrion, and therefore the oxaloacetate will go back into the matrix of the mitochondrion. Okay, so it means that we've gone in a total cycle because we used an oxaloacetate molecule at the start. It then was converted to citrate, which moved out. The citrate was converted to pyruvate, releasing the acetyl-CoA back into the cytoplasm. And then the pyruvates come back into the matrix of the mitochondrion and is going to be reconverted back into a molecule of oxaloacetate. So we've gone round completely in a cycle. Okay, right. So let's now talk about how we're going to um, convert pyruvate, uh, sorry, pyruvate back into oxaloacetate. Okay, so basically what we're going to do is we're going to bring in a molecule of uh, carb carbon dioxide. Okay, so in comes a molecule of carbon dioxide, which is within the matrix of the mitochondrion. And effectively what we're going to do is put it back onto this carbon here. So we're going to take that uh, hydrogen atom off there, okay? And then what we're going to do is we're going to completely reverse this reaction, basically. So imagine breaking the bond between the carbon and the hydrogen and sending both electrons back to the carbon. So remember, when we first did this reaction, this carbon had two electrons in the intermediate. So if we're going to completely reverse it, then uh, we should break this bond unfairly and give both electrons to the carbon. Okay, that then releases a proton into the solution. Okay, then what we're going to do is create, take this molecule of carbon dioxide, and it will be a different molecule of carbon dioxide, but I might as well use the structure that I've got here. We're going to break one of those bonds between the oxygen and the carbon, not both. And again, we're going to give both electrons back to this oxygen here to give the oxygen a negative charge. So it's gained an electron by nicking one off the carbon. Then we're going to bind this carbon here to this carbon here, and this carbon will put in both electrons, because remember, it's got this nice extra electron. It can give that away to this carbon, which has just lost an electron, because the oxygen took both when we broke that bond. And therefore, what we will end up with is a nice oxygen with a negative charge there, and we'll have our oxaloacetate molecule back again. Okay, now, when you do this reaction, you also have to hydrolyze ATP. So ATP 
is going to be hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. Okay, which means that you're going to have to bring in a water molecule as well to hydrolyze that ATP molecule. And the final product you're also going to get is that proton that was released from here. Okay, right, now the enzyme that catalyzes this conversion is then called pyruvate carboxylase. Okay, so it's the enzyme which adds a carbon dioxide molecule which will take the form of a, a carboxyl group onto pyruvate. Right, so that's how we go around in this complete cycle, uh, taking an oxaloacetate molecule from the matrix of the mitochondria and using it to shuttle this acetyl coenzyme A from the matrix of the mitochondria into the cytoplasm and then re um, well, rebringing our uh, oxaloacetate back into the matrix of the mitochondrion through this convoluted pathway. So, the overall message is that we have moved acetyl coenzyme A from the matrix of the mitochondrion into uh, the cytoplasm of uh, the cell. And overall, it required the hydrolysis of two ATP molecules. We hydrolyzed an ATP here and hydrolyzed an ATP here. So it was an active transport process. By all means, an indirect one, but it was an active transport process. Okay, right. Uh, so, in the next video then, we finish with the prerequisites now. Uh, we'll start with cholesterol biosynthesis, starting with this acetyl coenzyme A that we now have within the cytoplasm of the cell.